We need to heal our guts, but eating for gut health can be confusing. Will a meal of Brussels sprouts and sourdough do it? Is kombucha even healthy? And what are you even supposed to do with sauerkraut? But healing and rebalancing your gut microbiome doesn't have to be hard. All you need is the right eating plan with food lists and tasty recipes. Luckily, I've got just the man for you. Almost all of our behavior, almost all of our functioning, our health is literally controlled by this ecosystem that lives within us. The idea that we should be eating a high fiber diet primarily based in whole grains to me is one of the worst things that I see for gut health. Everybody thinks that they should pop this acid blocking drug so that they can have you know, a spicy vindaloo, for example. Multiple studies now show that these drugs correlate strongly with developing dementia. You can develop a good relationship with the most important part of you and, and save your life if you're interested. Welcome to the Health Optimization Podcast. I'm Tim Gray, the UK's leading biohacker. This podcast is all about gaining actionable advice from the world's top experts and sharing new breakthroughs in nature, biohacking, technology, and longevity research to help you live longer and happier. Everything I cover on this podcast are the things I've learned from the world's top medical professionals, researchers, scientists, and the authors in the health field. However, I'm none of those things. I'm just someone with a very keen mind for figuring out how to be as healthy as possible while aging gracefully and learning from the best. My only bias is health. Our gut is either our best friend or worst enemy. It all comes down to how you treat it. If your microbiome is out of whack, so is your immune system and your hormone levels. Poor gut health affects your mental health and longevity, risk of heart and neurodegenerative disease, as well as arthritis, diabetes, and even cancer. But if you look after your gut, it will look after you. The problem is we aren't doing that. In a recent UK health report, 58% of people said that they experienced gut health problems with 45% of those saying their issues are chronic and a third of people surveyed said that they have no clue what to do to heal their gut. So where do we start? Dr. Stephen Gundry, a cardiothoracic surgeon by profession, pivoted his career to teach people how to avoid surgery by using his unique vision of human nutrition. He's a researcher, a podcaster, and best-selling author of numerous books, including The Plant Paradox, The Energy Paradox, and Unlocking the Keto Code. And he's just released his newest book this week called Gut Check. This book equips you with everything you need to know about how to unlock your gut health, including a list of recipes to make it easy and tasty. And I'm grateful he's also going to be a speaker at this year's Health Optimization Summit. Dr. Stephen Gundry, welcome to the show. Jim, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to finally meet you as well. I've been following your work for a very, very long time. <laughs> so it's really exciting for me today for you to be on the show. Where we're going to start is, how did you pivot your clinical career from heart surgery to focusing on food and gut health? Because it's a pretty big jump. About 25, 28 years ago, uh, I, was, I was a very famous heart surgeon, uh, invented a lot of stuff to keep hearts alive during uh, surgery and heart transplant. And I was one of these idiots who would take on really challenging cases that nobody else wanted to. And there were a number of us in the United States. And I met a gentleman who I call Big Ed, um, who was uh, sent to me from Miami, Florida. He was 48 years old. He had inoperable coronary artery disease. And by that, we mean that all of his blood vessels were so clogged up that you couldn't find a place to put a bypass. You couldn't put stents in. And uh, people like him would go around to various centers and see if someone would take him on. And he did this for about six months before he met me, and everywhere he went, everybody turned him down. And uh, he ended up in my office in Loma Linda, California, Southern California. And I looked at his angiogram, uh, the movie of his heart, from six months previous. And I said, you know, I agree with everybody else. I can't help you. They're right. Um, there's just nothing we can do for you. And he says, yeah, that's what everybody says. But just a minute, let me tell you what I've done. Uh, I've been on a diet for the last six months and I've lost 45 pounds. Now, 
this guy was 265 pounds when I met him, hence the name Big Ed. <laughs> and he says, I've gone to a health food store and I'm taking a lot of supplements. And he had literally brought in a large shopping bag full of his supplements. And he said, well, maybe I did something in here. And, you know, I'm scratching my professor beard and going, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to change anything in there. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine, which is what I firmly believed back then. <laughs> and he said, well, look, you know, I've come all the way from Miami. Um, what would it hurt to get another angiogram, a new cardiac catheterization? And I go, eh, don't get your hopes up. But we did. And so in six months' time, this guy had cleaned out 50% of his coronary, of, of the blockages in his mm -hmm. coronary arteries. I mean, they were gone. Wow. Now, this is impossible. This, you know, it, it is impossible. Uh, <laughs> we were taught that coronary artery disease is progressive, that the best we could do is maybe slow it down. And... I was one of those surgeons who was famous for reoperating on people over and over again when they clogged up the bypasses that, you know, we had put in them before. So, and that's, you know, that's party line. So here's a guy who literally cleans out his coronary arteries in six months. So I start asking him about, well, tell me about this crazy diet. And just with uh, serendipity, uh, I was an undergraduate at Yale University back in the dark ages. And back in those days, we could design our own major. And it was basically a master's thesis program. And you had to have a thesis and defend it. And my thesis was you could take a great ape, manipulate its food supply, manipulate its environment, and you would arrive at a human being. I defended my thesis, got an honors, gave it to my parents, and went off to be a famous art surgeon. So as Big Ed is telling me about his diet, I went, well, 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 wait a minute. That's that's my thesis of what early man ate. And uh, I said, holy cow. So I called up my parents. Um, I said, hey, do you still have my thesis? And they said, yeah, it's in the shrine. <laughs> Send it up to me. And then I start looking at his supplements. And I was famous for protecting the heart from damage during heart surgery and during heart transplant uh, because I put a bunch of concoctions in the arteries and veins of the heart. And a lot of the stuff I was putting in this concoction to protect the heart, he was swallowing. And it quite frankly never occurred to me to swallow the dumb things. Mm -hmm. So I was a big fat guy, even though I was running 30 miles a week, going to the gym one hour a day. I had high blood pressure. I had prediabetes. I had arthritis. I did baby heart trans with, transplants with migraine headaches. And I had high cholesterol. And I was told it's genetic because my father was the same way. And so I decided to put myself on my thesis and start taking a bunch of supplements. And lo and behold, I lost 50 pounds my first year and another 20 subsequently, you know, kept it off for over 20 years. So then I started taking my patients that I operated on and putting them on this program after I operated on them so they would never have to come and see me again. And lo and behold, their blood pressure improved, their arthritis improved, their diabetes went away, their cholesterol numbers improved. And <laughs> after about a year of doing this, I had a really bad decision one morning that uh, I'm doing it all wrong. I shouldn't operate on people and then teach them how to avoid me. I should teach them how to eat so I won't have to operate on them. And now you can understand that's a very poor career decision for, uh, <laughs> for a heart surgeon. But I actually resigned my position uh, literally at the height of my career and uh, set up a clinic in Palm Springs, which is very near Loma Linda. And I basically told people, look, I, I want to take certain foods away from you. I want you to eat certain foods. I want you to go to a health food store and I want you to buy some supplements. And every three months, I want to draw blood work on you and let's see what happens. And so uh, kind of the rest is history. 
that resulted in probably my most famous book, The Plant Paradox, now seven and a half, uh, six and a half years ago, mm -hmm. uh, where I basically you know, codified what I was doing and uh, published a lot of papers about all this. So it was a really stupid idea initially, because even in academics, a heart surgeon can ha make a good living. But teaching people how to eat um, is not a good way to make a living, as as I found out and as my wife found out. But um, <laughs> once you, if you persevere, sometimes good things happen. So why is the gut so connected to not only physical health, but also emotional, mental, and brain health? You know, um, when I started doing all this years ago, uh, I w was fascinated that Hippocrates, the father of medicine, uh, said 2,500 years ago that all disease begins in the gut. I've spent now 25 odd years trying to figure out how he knew that. Um, <laughs> he was right. Um, and I think with every passing year, really thanks to the Human Microbiome Project, which finished, uh, was completed in 2016, not very long ago, we're, we're beginning to understand that these hundred trillion, at least, organisms uh, occupy a unique symbiotic ecosystem uh, within us. And with every literally passing day, we learn about how almost all of our behavior, almost all of our functioning, our health, our memory, uh, our heart is literally controlled by signals from this ecosystem that lives within us. And part of the gut check was to try and convince people that we've done a pretty good job of trying to annihilate the most important part of us, and that's our microbiome. But the good news is that you can um, de develop a good relationship with the most important part of you and, and, and save your life if you're interested. Yeah. I mean, I just like, I concur completely, obviously. Um, I, I mean, I went to a gastroenterologist in uh, King's College, London, back in 2013, and I said, I've got stabbing pains in my digestive system. My guts are all over the place, blah, 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 blah. I'm going, you know, eight to 10 times a day. I said, I'm thinking of trying some probiotics because I'd been on ciprofloxacin for, you know, nearly three months, which, you know, as you know, is pretty, pretty evil for a week, let alone for three months. Yep. And he said, there's no, there's no evidence to say that probiotics will help, Tim. And I just thought, just thought, this is this is weird. Anyway, so I went and brought Yakult of all things, just to, you know, at the time I was a, a beginner, yeah. I guess. And uh, yeah. so Yakult was a good start. And in fact, within three days of having probiotics, my gut pain stopped and my gut started to improve. So it's just like evidence suggests other ways, but medical training, well, I mean, I guess it's catching up now, but medical training didn't suggest. <laughs> it's, it's just, it just seems, make it make sense. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you an actual uh, interesting UK story. I uh, was a senior registrar at Great Ormond Street in uh, pediatric heart surgery in the mid-1980s. And uh, after we did heart surgery on babies, the sisters would go down to across the street to the store and buy yogurt. And they would start feeding uh, the babies yogurt the, the minute, uh, you know, they, they were able to. Um, there were two of us from the United States and one senior registrar from the UK. And we're going, what the heck, you know, uh, that's silly. What, you know, sisters, what are you doing that for? They said, well, you've, you know, you've destroyed these kids with your antibiotics and we're going to try to fix them. And we're going, yeah, that's, that's really cute. And, uh, you know, this is the mid 1980s, but the sisters knew back then. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? There's also the connection. I mean, I, I, obviously you're very, <laughs> you're the specialist in this, just, I'm just the novice, but the nitric oxide connection as well and um, and how this plays into obviously heart health and vasodilation and blah 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 all, all of the all of these areas and it's, it's just interesting how certain bacteria goes you don't produce nitric oxide in the same way or then you're carnivore or you're not eating the right plants and you're low in nitric oxide even though you think you're 
pretty healthy. But in fact, you know, your blood is not. And it was a big aha moment for me, actually, from A4M when I was in Vegas last week. Because there's a lot of nitric oxide brands around, actually, and it seems to be a, the next, uh, the new wave of things. You know, a few years ago, it was red light therapy and blah blah blah. But the point is, is like I started reading and I started diving into it and thinking, like, it's actually bonkers. And so I've tested probably about ten people now to see their nitric oxide levels, <laughs> and when they're predominantly meat based, and every single one of them, including myself, and I would say I'm very well optimized, was very low. Very low. And adding in beetroot, and actually I'm using a supplement right now as well, has improved my energy and my brain function so much from going super low in nitric oxide continually to being much higher. The reason why I say this about the gut bacteria, obviously, again, you're the expert in this, so I'd love to hear your take on it. But like the specific bacteria um, obviously break down citrulline, which would then go down into arginine, which would then supposedly, if it's paired with antioxidants, then actually can help you produce nitric oxide. But if it's meat-based only, you don't get those antioxidants, which then actually don't convert. Would, would that be in alignment with what you... Yeah, and it even gets worse than that. Um, as I write in, in Gut Check, you, when you're meat-based primarily, you make a, a lot of uh, another gasotransmitter called hydrogen sulfide, which a lot of people know as the rotten egg smell. And uh, hydrogen sulfide was once thought to be toxic. Uh, but like so many things, there is a bell-shaped curve and there is a Goldilocks effect of nitric oxide. And when you got the right amount of nitric oxide, it actually facilitates, I mean, hydrogen sulfide, it facilitates nitrous oxide, nitric oxide production. And it's actually very protective to the endothelium of blood vessels. But if you're on primarily a meat-based diet, carnivore diet, you make too much hydrogen sulfide and it becomes damaging. And so you're right. When I And I have people on a carnivore diet as an elimination diet for a, a bit of time, but you watch and they're inflammatory markers. They feel great but their inflammatory markers in their blood start going up and up and up. And when I show this to them, they go, whoa, you know, um, what's going on? I said, well, the problem is you've stopped feeding your microbiome the things they need to literally keep you well. Mm. And you can see it. It's, I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, again, with the the carnivore diet, and don't get me wrong, I was carnivore for a very long time. I mean, it, you know, the bandwagon, it's like, you know, various different diets that come and go and we all try it and then we figure out what's gone wrong with it and like with keto diet and things. But I think yeah. with the carnivore diet, I mean, there's still advocates that say, don't eat any plants, don't eat any plants. But my... My thoughts are, is like any extreme diet. Okay, ancestrally, there's probably a small percentage of people that only ate meat. And, and you know, you may or may not have those genes or bacteria. You, there may have been many people that ate predominantly plants historically. But I think the majority of people actually, in my opinion, have a mix of these things for various reasons. And when someone says completely cut a food group out completely, whether it's plants or meat, I just feel like you should be able to handle this food, i.e. your body is too sensitive. There's probably mast cell activation somewhere causing problems and inflammation, which is why you can't handle plants or, or meat. So do a reset. Like, I mean, I did 18 months to two years on carnivore. It worked very well for me until it didn't. And then, and, and I did vegan, full vegan for a while until it didn't. And then I saw my metabolomics results showing it was ridiculously low in many things. I think you're alluding to another important fact. Long ago, we evolved uh, eating a lot of plant material. And plants don't want to be eaten. And I've, you know, made my career telling people that certain plants don't like us. And I firmly believe that. But we had a defense system, a very robust microbiome that was capable of eating uh, these plant toxins. Believe it or not, there, sh there are normally bacteria that eat oxalates. And there are bacteria that eat gluten. 
In fact, as I talk about in the book, if you look at super, super old people who are thriving, they have a set of bacteria that eat xenobiotics. All these crazy estrogen disruptors, plastics, they eat them. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, as I've talked about in others, we have wiped out the entire defense system uh, against these. And that's why there are some people who uh, the defense systems of plants is pretty doggone good and makes you feel bad. In fact, mm. some people have accused me of being the father of the carnivore diet because, <laughs> and no, I'm not. Thank you very much. But taken to the extreme, you would think that avoiding these plant defense compounds uh, would be a good idea. Mm. But that's not the case. Uh, we've evolved to actually have a microbiome that defends us. And we've evolved now to realize that many of these plant compounds are essential as food for our microbiome, the polyphenols in plants. And it's our microbiome that then activates these plant compounds and makes them uh, physiologically available to do their thing in us. And that's some of the really exciting news. So we've just done a terrible job of supporting uh, our best friends. What are some of the red flags that indicate a problem in the gut to you? Like, what's the thing that makes you go, ha ha, I know where this is right now? <laughs> well, the strange thing is... Um, Hippocrates was right. All disease begins in the gut. So if you're seeing me for headaches, uh, I'm going to look in the gut. If you're seeing me because you're anxious or depressed, I'm going to look in the gut. Recently, I had a patient, a uh, guy in his 70s, very healthy, a quote unquote, and uh, he was sent by a friend and the guy's on uh, three medications to shrink his prostate. And um uh, I, he said, I'm really healthy. And I said, well, uh, okay, well, how come you're on three medications to shrink your prostate? He said, what are you talking about? He said, guys get big prostates as they get older. And I go, did you ever wonder why you might get a big prostate as you get older? He said, well, yeah, that's normal. I said, I don't have a big prostate. I used to have a big prostate, but I don't any longer. And I'm not on any medications. And he said, what, what are you talking about? I said, my prostate shrunk. And he said, what? I said, believe it or not, there's really good evidence that endotoxins coming from the rectum are the cause of prostatic hypertrophy. And if you stop the leaky gut, the prostate shrinks. And he goes, what? Mm -hmm. I said, it's a, not a normal thing to have a big prostate as you get older. This is exposure to leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And I had a woman, a 54-year-old woman, who recently had a hysterectomy for, uh, for fibroids. And I said, did you ever try to shrink your uh, fibroids before all this? She said, what are you talking about? You, you can't shrink fibroids. I said, well, it's funny. We have a lot of women who have shrunk their fibroids. She said, well, how do you do that? And I said, well, there's really good evidence that fibroids are caused by endotoxemia from leaky gut and your uterus is sitting right next to your colon. What? So these are the sort of things that I would have gone, oh, don't be ridiculous 25 <laughs> years ago. That, that's ridiculous. And then I get to watch it. Uh, or, you know, like something simple like eczema, gone when you stop leaky gut. Now, if you'd asked me 15, 20 years ago what I thought about leaky gut, I would have <laughs> told you it was pseudoscience. I, I really would have. But thanks to uh, Alessio Fasano, who's now at Harvard and other people, um, this is proven. It's measurable. We can watch it occur and we can watch it go away. And so, yeah, Hippocrates, we should have paraphrased him. <laughs> all disease begins in a leaky gut. And for the most part, all disease can be cured or go into remission by fixing the leaky gut. So people may not know that stress can reduce stomach acid and cause digestive issues. Why, why do you think this happens? You know, um, we definitely, I see about 80% of my practice is now autoimmune patients who 
want to get off their biologics. Uh, they realize that this is it, being on a transplant drug for the rest of their lives and not having a transplant is probably a dumb idea. Or they're on two or three uh, biologics and still have an active d disease process. Uh, and these folks uh, have, have taught me that many of them, a stressful event uh, started this. Um, one of my patients with, uh, with Crohn's, uh, her mother died um, suddenly when she was a teenager. And literally kind of two days later, she started having uh, bowel issues that persisted for, you know, 20 years. And she can, you know, point to literally that time. And so one of the things that does happen with stress is that we tend to divert all the blood flow, uh, all the splanchnic blood flow from the intestines uh, elsewhere. We tend to divert it to muscles because normally the only time we would have been stressed was when a saber-toothed tiger was about to eat us or a leopard was chasing us up a tree. And we would want to divert as much blood flow to our muscles as possible. So we would literally cut off the flow of blood to our intestines. And we actually still see that uh, in, for instance, marathon runners that at mile you know, 24, they're stopping to have bloody diarrhea because uh, they've literally sloughed the lining of their uh, intestines and colon because they're not getting any blood flow. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's not a surprise that stress uh, is capable of doing this mm -hmm. yeah it's crazy one thing I, I heard is that when you're stressed you burn through salt and when you become dehydrated obviously sodium you don't make enough hydrochloric acid for the stomach so therefore stress means you need more salt and needing more salt means you don't have enough stomach acid so therefore you down regulate stomach acid which means you don't kill off bacteria or viruses or whatnot parasites in your food which then is the beginning of the leaky gut in the first first place and obviously then that has the circular effect of support uh, affecting the liver which then starts down regulating to compensate for it potentially as well and so it's really interesting how stress is you know when I when I went to the doctor many years ago and he said are you stressed and I was like not really but the thing is I was and from all the symptoms that were going on I was so I can understand why he asks but the thing is the detail of what stress actually does to us on a physiological level is insane yeah, and they, the other thing that people forget, uh, one of my deadly disruptors is these uh, acid blocking drugs. <laughs> the you know that that are ubiquitous. Uh, everybody thinks that they should you know pop this acid blocking drug uh, so that they can have uh, you know a spicy vindaloo, uh, for example, uh, and. You know, I want Vindaloo, but so I'm going to block my stomach acid so I don't get heartburn. And it's like you have no idea what you're doing. You're you're supposed to have stomach acid, among other things. You're right. It's great for killing bacteria that shouldn't be in there or other parasites. It's also great for breaking down proteins, and lectins happen to be proteins. I mean, we're we're really well designed, and then we have to go and screw it up so we can have a spicy meal. <laughs> it's quite funny when I hear anyone say, oh, yeah, I get uh, get heartburn or acid reflux or whatever. And they're like, oh, but I just pop a Rennie. I'm just like, you do realize that's like literally doing the opposite, the exact opposite of what you should do. And it's like, and then people spend years on it and then they end up having serious digestive issues and, and, and actually really bad, really bad gut issues as a result. Yeah. It's bonkers, isn't and, it? And brain issues um, that, you know, Multiple studies now show that these drugs uh, correlate strongly with developing dementia. And it's, and I mean, in the United States, there's a black box warning on all these uh, proton pump inhibitors that you should only take them for two weeks maximum. And yet you're right. People are on these things for years and years and years without realizing what they're doing. If you want to learn how to take control of your health and you're sick of traditional healthcare and temporary fixes, make sure you come to the Health Optimization Summit. You can join other like-minded health enthusiasts and meet the world's leading minds in health, wellness, and science. You can even test out a load of groundbreaking health tech and latest supplements. Get your ticket at healthoptimization.com. 
how does the health of our liver impact our gut health, would you say? Well, one of the problems that I think uh, we should realize is almost everything that exits the wall of our gut passes via this very large vein, the portal vein, into our liver. And the liver then, it's true that 80% of our immune system, our white blood cells line our gut, but there's a secondary checkpoint within the liver. And it's uh, there's a set of immune cells, the Cooper cells, that everything has to go past another checkpoint in the liver. And what's fascinating is that there's very strong evidence that uh, hepatic inflammation or fatty liver, when you look at biopsies of these people, there is a war going on in the liver. And that war is occurring because of the translocation of bacteria and other particles through a leaky gut that then hit the liver as its second checkpoint. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually, to me, not surprising at all. Um, way back when, when we were dealing with this, it was interesting to me and others that compounds like milk thistle or uh, D-limonene had a fairly dramatic effect on lowering hepatic inflammation. And now we're beginning to realize that there wasn't something magical, mystical happening in the liver. It was changing the gut microbiome and affecting leaky gut. And the liver then got to relax. So mm. yeah, the liver is uh, where the next checkpoint is. Yeah. Is it Liver health is something, again, I've taken a keen interest on. As you can probably tell some of the areas that I've taken a very keen interest on. But um, the liver is a really, I think, so many practitioners nowadays, because functional practitioners have become the thing, you know, like the, the very, very popular. But I've seen people on 30, 40, 50 supplements. And I like, at one point, I was doing that myself. And I've, I've seen, obviously, Dave Asprey put 50 in his mouth in one go as well and, and eat the lot. It's like, I look at it and I just think, that is doing so many, so many things to the liver, like making it do so many things all at once. And while supplements are good, targeted, done specifically, but throwing more and more and more down your throat, I think is, is crazy because actually one thing I noticed is that actually my liver health and my digestion and, you know, color of stool and things like that changed significantly for the better when I had less and less supplements, but the right ones. And so I think one thing that liver health obviously in terms of bile production, which helps your stool move and things like that, are massively important. And supplements are also super, super important. And I, you know, I'm a big advocate of them. But I think this more, 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 more approach can be quite detrimental to the liver, which I don't know what you're, whether you think that that has an impact on the gut as a result from stressing the liver from too many supplements or not. Well, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of supplements. Um, one of the reasons for that um, are if you look at hunter gatherers, they'll they'll interact with uh, well over two thousand different plant species on a rotating basis, and all of those plant species have different polyphenols. And as I talk to even my organic uh, aficionados, uh, if you really think that you can interact with two thousand different plant species on a rotating basis. I've got oceanfront property in Palm Springs, California here, in, which is a desert, uh, to sell you. Uh, so <laughs> the problem is uh, I use a lot of polyphenol-based supplements. And one of the things that I've written about in the last couple of books is we've known that polyphenols are not absorbed very well. And we, we used to think that polyphenols were antioxidants, and they're actually not. But what has become clear is that polyphenols are actually some of the favorite food of gut bacteria. They are actually essential prebiotics. And so uh, the more I've studied that connection and the more I've looked at patients' blood work in terms of vascular health and the leaky gut, uh, the more impressed I am that you do need to get a lot of polyphenols into your system. And mm. so I I eat and swallow a lot of polyphenol-containing supplements. 
Just out of interest, explain for the, li- the listeners the difference between polyphenols and antioxidants, if you, if you could. Most every year, there's a, there's a big meeting on polyphenols um, every year. And the organizer of the meeting is a, is a professor from Paris, uh, Marvin Edis. And we had a meeting in Lisbon about 10 years ago, maybe more. And uh, there's about 400 people in the meeting. And he started the meeting. He says, uh, anyone here who thinks that polyphenols are antioxidants can leave because I don't have enough time to bring you up to speed. And I'm, I'm going, what? And we've actually become quite good friends. And I'm going, so I go up to him. I said, really? And he says, no, they're not. They're not. And, you know, I'll, I'll I'll spend some time with you and teach you about this. But yeah, they are not antioxidants. They are, they were used by plants. And I've written about this and I don't have to bore you. Plants use polyphenols to uh, uncouple their mitochondria, which are chloroplasts, which are damaged by making ATP from sunlight, from photons. And they're also damaged by environmental stressors. And they produce polyphenols to basically protect their mitochondria from damage. And so all those beautiful colors, all those dark colors in fruits and vegetables, those are polyphenols. They're in tea. I'm having some polyphenol right now. Now, uh, don't put uh, milk in your tea because it binds the polyphenols, but that's another story. (laughs) So what we now know is that when the bacteria in us eat these polyphenols and they then turn these polyphenols into absorbable compounds and these polyphenols then uncouple our mitochondria, protect our mitochondria. And the more you uncouple your mitochondria to a point, the the longer you live and the healthier you are. So uh, I'm a big fan of polyphenols. Underrated, very underrated. In in fact, um, it's amazing how um, that's actually uh, around heart rate variability and polyphenols specifically. Um, There's a brand that was doing polyphenol supplement and doing heart rate variability testing. And by adding in polyphenols over a period of time, you see that your heart rate variability increased pretty significantly, actually. So it's amazing how powerful they are on so many levels. Well, yeah, I, I got into this years ago when I was first, you know, doing this with my patients. And we had several tests that could look at um, flexibility in blood vessels, their ability to dilate. And we also have still a test that looks at simplistically how sticky the inside of your blood vessels are. And I would send people out for grapeseed extract and French maritime tree bark called pycnogenol. And I'd also put them on fish oil. And we'd see when they were taking these compounds that their blood vessels got more flexible and their stickiness went away. And I'm going, wow, a couple of dumb polyphenols, you know, do, do that. So that's actually, and I wrote these papers, presented them at the American Heart Association. I don't think anybody believed me, but I mean, there's the data. <laughs> the system will change. It will at some point. It has, it's, it's struggling. It's holding on for dear life at some point. It, it will. I mean, it was the same with stem cells back in the day with all the research and the, how the medical journals just didn't want to publish anything about it. And it, I mean, obviously that's changing more and more and more, but I think the system is, it's, it's holding on. It's like this, it's a tug of war. It's like, it's going to go one way at some point. It just, I think... It's trying to turn an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, 100%. Uh, one that is finally financially incentivized to be going in one direction as well. But anyway, so um, what foods do we often think are gut healthy but actually aren't? Well, one of the things that uh, unfortunately um, we have to blame uh, a physician from the UK uh, that fiber is fiber is fiber and that we should have uh, lots of fiber for uh, health and unfortunately fiber is not fiber is fiber there are insoluble fibers that are primarily in grains and then there are soluble fibers and it turns out that 
soluble fibers uh, in tubers, for instance, or in the chicory family, like radicchio or uh, Belgian endive or frise, or artichokes or um, Jerusalem artichokes, are really one of the preferred foods for gut bacteria. And gut bacteria not only can't use insoluble fiber, but insoluble fiber is to me like swallowing razor blades. And that's actually why it promotes bowel movements, because you're trying to get rid of those razor blades. So the idea that we should be eating a high fiber diet primarily based in whole grains, to me, is one of the worst things that I see for gut health. And in fact, 100% of my patients with leaky gut, and most of them have leaky gut when we measure them, have antibodies to the various components of wheat, wheat germagglutinin, gluten, wheat proteins, 100% of them. And when we take these healthy foods away from them, uh, their gut heals and which is really exciting, they lose all their antibodies to the various forms of wheat. It can take nine months to a year, uh, so it's not overnight. But yeah, we've I think we've done a, a disservice, um, and we, we blame it on an English surgeon, Dennis Burkett. Um, <laughs> the damn British. <laughs> well, well, he had the right idea. Uh, he, you know, he realized that all the, he, he was a colon surgeon and he did mission work in Africa and he couldn't find anybody to do uh, colon surgery on or treat hemorrhoids because nobody had them. And he go, well, what the heck? And he started following these Africans around and he realized that their stools were as big as termite hills. And he's going, what the heck? And he said, what are these people eating? Well, they were eating tons of tubers. And he says, ah, oh, you know, we got to have big stools. And he came back to the UK. And sadly, the only fiber uh, that was really available in the UK was uh, grain fibers, oats and wheat. And he, equiv he said that, well, fiber is fiber. And Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Yeah. Actually, I did a, a post on Instagram a few days ago about fiber and why, what the different types are and why certain ones are important and why some should be included in the diet, but not necessarily too much. So it's, yeah, it's, <clears throat> in fact, once upon a time, I got on the psyllium husk <laughs> train, <laughs> as I think everyone does in this space at some point, which is, is good, but it is, it's like you're saying, it scratches, it scratches its way through you and it's like pipe cleaner I <laughs> always found. But the other thing is that you say, you're interesting, you said about Jerusalem aftershoke, really interesting, because whenever I have extreme bloating and extreme gas, and I'm talking extreme, I know that I've had some, even if I don't know I've eaten it. And I've tested it and it's actually such an amazing prebiotic. It's literally my guts. It's like I'm pregnant in, in 20 minutes. Yeah, your bacteria say, oh, thank you so much. I love this stuff, you know. Uh, and, I, and I, you know, in my previous books, I, I basically say, hey, step on the gas. Uh, because <laughs> the, these are actually, these are gasotransmitters. Mm. And they actually are a language mm. from our gut microbiome to our mitochondria, to our brain. Uh, it's gas is, gas is good. It, uh, except for those around you. Point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, except exactly. for those around you. <laughs> I think, I think Anna, my, my girlfriend would, uh, <laughs> would not agree. So what would you say good foods that are good for gut health then? Well, I think, and that's another part that uh, I think we're really beginning to uncover uh, it it takes it takes an assembly line of a bacteria to make a product that we need to affect our health. We need lots of different bacteria. Make, one bacteria is going to make an ingredient that a second bacteria needs to eat to produce a third ingredient that the fourth bacteria needs to eat to produce the end product that we're looking for. Uh, that's number one. So it takes a village uh, to do this. The other thing that I've made a point of trying to get people to uh, grasp is, in general, uh, we could eat all the prebiotic fiber in the world. 
But a paper a couple of years ago out of Stanford, the Sonnenberg husband and wife team, it was really illustrative to me. They took two groups of people. One group, they gave a lot of prebiotic fiber. It was inulin. And they looked at their gut microbiome diversity, and quite frankly, a more diverse microbiome is a good thing. And they looked at inflammatory markers. And despite getting all this prebiotic fiber, they didn't change their gut microbiome diversity, and their inflammatory markers didn't change. And everybody's going, why, what? Well, the second group, they gave the inulin to, but they also gave them fermented foods. Now, it was primarily yogurts and kefirs and sauerkrauts uh, and vinegars. And that combination of the fermented foods and the prebiotic fiber, these guys had much improved gut microbiome diversity and their inflammatory markers went down. So you have to actually, if you will, prime the pump. Now, everybody says, oh, you need to eat probiotics. Most of these foods, if there are any living bacteria, hopefully they're dead when they reach the stomach acid and who cares about them? Mm. But as I write in the book, dead men tell no tales, but dead bacteria do. Mm. And we now know that dead bacteria and the postbiotics that they make in the process of fermentation actually carry messages that then tell or provide the substrates for bacteria to then use the prebiotic fiber. And I think that's actually really exciting. And it's easy to do. I mean, for instance, vinegars are full of postbiotics. Short-chain fatty acid, acetic acid, is a, is a great short-chain fatty acid builder. And even if your probiotic doesn't have any living bacteria, it contains all of these messages that really are essential. And it explains why cultures through, through eons use fermentation for literally everything because uh, there was no storage system and you you literally had to ferment everything it's it's funny you say that because the next my next question was you know people find it hard to you know incorporate single foods into their diet like you know kefir or sauerkraut and and, and in fact i'm going to ask you in a second like what are your gut friendly recipes or meals that you recommend but everywhere i've traveled around the world in every country, there's always been a different fermented food, at yep. least one. And like, for instance, there's kvass or, you know, sauerkraut or kefir or, you know, whatever, whatever. And it seems that it's just been so ancestrally used in just about every culture I've been to, everywhere, actually. And yet it's still underrated in the West. Yeah. And we forget that um, traditional cheeses are a fermented food. And there's, I talk a lot about uh, these super long lived people in the blue zones. One of the reasons they're blue zones is they're sh sheep and goat herders and they eat a lot of sheep and goat yogurt and cheeses. The people with the longest lifespan of a country, uh, longevity are, is actually this little country between Spain and France, Andorra. And the Andorran life expectancy is 90 years, which is pretty doggone good. And these guys are sheep herders, but they also eat sausages every day. And you go, wait a minute, you're eating, you know, you're eating cheese and sausage and you're the longest living people in the world. Well, it turns out that traditionally prepared sausages are fermented foods. And, uh, Believe it or not, the traditional sausages uh, are actually really a good source of fermented uh, information. Yeah, not supermarket English sausages uh, that are made, no. made from no, 50, no. 50 different pigs and 50 no, different pigs. not houses. a banger, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, and, Definitely and in not. fact, they have gluten added and wheat oh, yeah. and God the knows fill, what yeah. added to them. It's just insane. Yeah. So... um. Is there a simple uh, principle people can uh, use to understand whether food is good or bad for their gut? You know, one of the things that's been interesting to me is we do a lot of leaky gut testing, blood tests, 
and we do a lot of food sensitivity tests. And when I wrote The Plant Paradox, uh, about 90% of people who had an issue for the reason they picked up the book, about 90% of them would resolve their issue just by following the rules of the book. And in my own practice, that was pretty much the same. About 90% of people with autoimmune diseases resolved their issue. Uh, Their markers went away, their leaky gut went away, but about 10% of them didn't. And when, when better tests for food sensitivities came along, one of the things that was striking was that a lot of what we what I would have thought were healthy food, perfectly safe foods, these things would show up on their food sensitivity tests. And when you then go and show the folks these tests, and one of them would be, for instance, ginger, believe it or not, shows up a lot as a troublemaker on food sensitivity tests. And you go, but wait a minute, ginger is gut healing. And then you start talking to your patient and you go, you know, I was taking a lot of ginger to heal my gut, but you know, every time I had ginger tea, uh, it, it bothered me. Mm. And I go, well, it's interesting. Cause you know, here it is. Or, uh, almonds to me are, were a classic, um, early on before I wrote the plant paradox, we had banned almonds because a lot of my autoimmune patients, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, just said right off the bat, almonds bother me. And so we just banned almonds. And, uh, and there's a, there's a lectin in the peel of almonds and, you know, certain countries like Portugal and Spain Mm. peel the almonds, Marcona almonds. So we banned it. And when I wrote the plant paradox, uh, my editor said, man, you are a really mean guy. You've taken away everything. You know, <laughs> throw us a bone here. Come on. <laughs> and I said, well, um, you know, a peeled almond is probably pretty safe because the lectin is in the peel. And OK, you can have blanched almond flour and, and Marcon almonds. So we put that in. Mm. And through the years, this almonds kept popping up on a lot of my autoimmune patients as a trigger. And we'd take even almond flour away from them and their psoriasis patch would would shrink or their Crohn's got a whole lot better. Mm. Vanilla beans show up quite frequently, believe it or not. And tropical fruits show up quite frequently. So I guess to answer your question, people often if they really start thinking about it, can identify foods that they go, you know, that really bothered me. For instance, beer. Um, (laughs) I just can't drink beer. And it has nothing to do with bloating. And now I realize, of course, it's a great source of gluten. Um, But beer always bothered me. And, you know, you're trying to be nice and go have a pint after, you know, after work in the UK and just always bothered me. Well, now I know, right? Okay. And finally, what are the top foods anyone listening should add to their weekly grocery shop? Well, I think the more you can find um, really good uh, plain yogurts, particularly sheep and goat yogurts, uh, you should add that to your repertoire. I have a collection of, of eight to 10 vinegars at any time. And I'm I literally will take some vinegar, put it in some sparkling water and make myself a sparkling uh, beverage uh, to have. I supposedly am the inventor of the fake Coke where you put balsamic vinegar in San Pellegrino and um, it became a YouTube sensation or a TikTok (laughs) sensation. But yeah, I wrote about that years ago. Uh, So that's an easy thing to do. One of the things I've always been amazed when I go to particularly France and Italy is that almost every salad I've ever, I've ever had there had some form of chicory in it. And the, the more I realize these guys, you know, why are they putting chicory in all these salads? Well, they're a really great source of prebiotic fiber, particularly inulin. And, and that's an easy thing to do. I mean, radicchio now is, is, is in every grocery store. Some people call it Italian red lettuce. It's not, but it's, it's easy to add to your repertoire. 
And the lastly, the more the more uh, tubers you add to your diet, like sweet potatoes or even you know the root vegetables like turnips and parsnips, uh, you cook them and then cool them and then reheat them. Uh, to make more resistant starches. And resistant starches, as the name implies, are resistant, more resistant to our digestive enzymes. And so more arrive uh, down to the gut microbiome for, for munching on. <laughs> Food, food's food. <laughs> Dr. Stephen Gundry, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been a fantastic conversation. I've really enjoyed exploring in the details. So thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Tim, great to talk to you and uh, look forward to coming on again in the near future. I'll write another book. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Health Optimization Summit next year. <laughs> exactly. I can't wait to come back. Yeah. 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 We've had a lot of good feedback and many, many people ask for you, actually. It's been quite overwhelming. So I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks again. massive thank you to my guest, Dr. Stephen Gundry. Learn more about Stephen at drgundry.com or check out the Dr. Gundry podcast on YouTube. You've been listening to the Health Optimization Podcast. I'm Tim Gray. Comment and leave the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel to see more. You can also find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all the usual places you like to listen. Check out the show description for extra information and the links. See you next time. And remember, spread the health. The information contained in this podcast is provided for informational purposes and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Information found or received through the podcast should not be used in place of a consultation or advice from a healthcare provider. If you suspect you have a medical problem or should you have any healthcare-related questions, please promptly call or see your healthcare provider. This podcast, including host Tim Gray and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements and advertisements for products or services. Before using any products referenced on the podcast, consult with your healthcare provider, carefully read all labels, and heed all directions and cautions that accompany the products. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. This podcast is owned by Health Optimization Limited.